You can have a seat if you like. I'll introduce you as you sit right here. Uh, like Shazie's Dr. Clark, Dr. John Southwick was uh, born and raised in this area and chose to return here to practice medicine, which I think is just wonderful. You obviously loved Champlain. John was, uh, he graduated from Champlain High School in 1950. Um, Shadyside Academy in Pittsburgh, PA in 1951. Yale University in 1955. And New York Medical College in 1959. He did his internship and residency both at uh, Waterbury Hospital in Waterbury, Connecticut. Little stint in the Army. Yes. And then back here to practice medicine from 1963 to 2004. And uh, he and Dr. Clark shared patients when either one of them was traveling. He's going to talk a little bit about that. He's been a, a great help to me in uh, putting together the exhibit about Dr. Clark, just giving me an idea of what it was like along the way. And so we thought it would be fun for you all to hear and talk about the old days. Mm -hmm. And you welcome questions, right? Yes. Interruptions, corrections, additions, <laughs> subtractions. Oh, good. Some of you guys might, or you gals, I'm sorry, might hear something that, oh no, that's not the way it was. <laughs> Interrupt me, I don't mind. Uh -huh. so right, Dick? I don't mind being interrupted. And oh, thanks oh, for oh. coming on this awful weather night. I really appreciate you all coming out. Mm -hmm. Dr. John Southwick, at your service. Get the right folder here. My main uh, trend is going to be to talk about Dr. Clark and also about the changes that we have seen. Now, many of you will recognize this, many of you know about him. Uh, so if I'm repeating things, bear with me. Anyway, uh, to start out, uh, I'd like to read a letter that I recently wrote to my granddaughter when she was admitted to medical school. And uh, I hope it's not too self-serving when I read it, please. <clears throat> Dear Emily, it is great joy for us that hard work and persistence resulted in your medical school acceptance. Let me say, the substance of what I'm going to tell you about, I think, applied to Dr. Clark. I have no question about that. Please bear with me when I suggest what the essentials are that make for a good physician. Be available, give focused service. Now that's something that I'll talk more about later. Practice evidence-based medicine. That's something that has changed over the years for a number of reasons. And do no harm. Remember to keep in strict confidence what your patients tell you and what you find on examination. Above all, be and show that you are caring and compassionate. Understanding <clears throat> one's limitation, especially in primary care, what we used to call general practice, and be willing to seek assistance is important. Keep current with the ever ongoing changes in medicine. Be a good listener. And in that way, you will get to know your patients and how they describe their symptoms, which can often be used to lead to a diagnostic pathway that's accurate 80% of the time. I, I hear that as a criticism today. Maybe it's because I'm getting old, but I hear that the listening part of the examination is kind of done away with. Get through whatever testing is necessary and get on with it. But if you listen and know your patients, and I'm going to interrupt this part and tell you why I feel that's important with an example of a pet peeve that I have. 
patient going to the emergency room has a discomfort. And the second question asked after a name is, would you grade that discomfort from 1 to 10? You don't ask a patient that question if you don't know that patient. Because there are any number of patients that everything is a 10. And there are many that will say it's a 1. They will hide whatever's going on from fear. He always significant that often near the end of life, specific treatments may neither be indicated nor helpful. But your role as a physician does not end there. Patients and family members need to know and feel that your presence at that time of comfort care is genuine. I always felt a personal loss when one of my patients died. And I think even to this day, I'm probably like many other people, I read the obituary and if one of my former patients passes away, it hurts. And I feel that and I always did. That caring that I said in the beginning can be conveyed in a number of ways to the family long after, and should be, long after the funeral. Because the grief that family members feel does last longer than just that time of everybody else's grief. Emily, there are two don'ts. And don't let me be presumptuous here, but my two don'ts are, because we live in a litigious society, don't practice defensive medicine just because of that. You must, and I know that this will happen, I know that the focus in evaluating a patient is to be up, up, utmost, totally objective, <coughs> never letting your emotions get in the way. That's the, that's the, uh, the trend now, and those of you, uh, Gloria and whatever, are in medicine, know that it's an objective evaluation of the patient. You have the symptoms, you objectively examine the patient, you get x-rays or lab tests, and your plan of treatment is based primarily just on objective. And Emily, there was a time when medicine was considered an honorable profession with inherent trust and respect. Unfortunately, I have sensed some erosion in that concept, perhaps because the emphasis in some instances is toward fees rather than genuinely focusing on the patient's problem. There, that trust and respect must be earned, but that will should not be a goal, and your goal should be to respect the welfare of your patients. Now, on to the main fact. I guess maybe I've known Dr. Clark not as long as many of you have, but I've known him for years, even before I came back to practice medicine in 1963. He by all means, was the last of our North country's true birth to death to general practitioners. It'll never happen again. And I'll talk to you about that a little bit later as to why it'll never happen again. Right? <laughs> Barbara, I looked over the top and I didn't even see you here in the beginning. I'm sorry. I just good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Barb was a great office manager. I've got to stop here and tell you <laughs> that my life was nowhere near as organized as Dr. Clark's were, or like somebody like Dick Matat, who has everything in order. I was organized because I had staff in the office to organize for me, and my wife was well organized. So I fell into it and tried to follow along with that. <clears throat> Got sidetracked, I'm sorry. He was, I said, the last, and will never happen again, often delivering babies, 
say in the morning, of course, if they would do, treating their siblings and parents during day, but still had enough energy left in the evenings to tend to the grandparents and great-grandparents. He cared for, and many of you know, he cared for many generations to His schedule <clears throat> and he was a remarkably, as I said, well-organized physician, with office hours in the morning and during the afternoon visited patients in their homes. House calls for two reasons. Either too ill to come to the office or no transportation. And back when, it's not really the fact now, but back when, a lot of people and that age group, and I'm not talking about 100 years ago, I'm talking about 50 years ago. Going to the hospital meant the end of life. Go to the hospital, you never come out. So they're not going to go to the hospital. They refuse to go. And it very often wasn't because of financial circumstances. They just would not go. So they needed to be taken care of at home. So that was the first reason. And the second reason, I said, there very often there wasn't transportation available. And to help people get to the hospital, we had ambulance crews, but with first aid people that were well trained, but certainly not with the amount of uh, expertise and uh, experience as well as training that the emergency medical technicians have to take. Uh, when I say that, I, I, I guess maybe like the rest of you, I've been a little bit saddened in the last couple of days because I was on. EMS board in Champlain and knew all this crew very well. And it's uh, it, it just, it's, well, they're giving their service and things happen, unfortunately. And, uh, it's, well, how can you explain it? I can't. Anyway, uh, he would usually, he had a system of house calls, as I remember him telling me, and I knew this because at a time, I think in 63, and 64, and maybe early 65, I did cover some of the times that people were aware, away, which was rare. And he always made sure that Ann Powers went with me to know what to do for each patient <coughs> rather than depend on me to make a decision. I'm sorry, Gloria, that was before your time. <laughs> anyway, his, his schedule was usually like this. He'd see patients, on Shazy and West Shazy on Monday, Sciota, Altona on Tuesday, Moores and Moores Forks on Wednesday, Champlain on Thursdays, remember Thursday was his day off, and Fridays, Ross's Point, Cedar Hedge Nursing Home. I'm going to diverge, uh, diverge a little bit there. He used to want to see his patients in the nursing homes every week. In the beginning, that was okay, but after a bit, particularly when Medicare came in, they would not allow nursing home patients to be seen. You know this. Right? Every week, whether they needed to be or not, you could document the necessity, but it was difficult to do. So even though he didn't get paid for those calls in the nursing home on every week, he would go and see them anyway. That was his routine, and he wanted to make sure those people were seen every week. Uh, that was on Friday. And of course, uh, that quickly could change depending on the circumstances. Late afternoons, he went to the hospital, did his hospital rounds, and also saw patients. He had patients in Plattsburgh, went to the nursing homes in Plattsburgh, and often come back for evening hours. Uh, and Saturday, he'd have Saturday morning hours. Did you have Saturday morning hours with him, Gloria? Oh, yes. And Sundays he'd see patients after church. He'd make arrangements for them to come to the office after church. In spite of all this, I never once saw him look fatigued. He didn't look tired. Uh, and he always walked, and of course drove that Cadillac at a pretty risky <laughs> pace. I don't think anybody ever suggested putting the governor on that car a bit. Did they, Dick? That green cattle I used to go by the house about two feet off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Anyway, uh, when I first came to Champlain, start practice, 
uh, to Seoul was 1963. I, saw, I sought out his help for a re reciprocal treat, uh, evaluation of patients and to see his patients when he was away, if he was willing, and mine when I was away. Previous doctor in Champlain says, he'll never meet you. He won't be at all happy to see you coming back to Champlain. Just the opposite. He was very cordial to me and very helpful, and uh, we had a good ongoing relationship with taking care of our patients. The understanding, and it wasn't written anywhere, is that his patients seen by me would go back to see him when they came back, and the same with mine. Uh, there are a couple of instances I'll talk about later where that came to be. Uh, uh, it wasn't a contentious type of problem, but it, it came to be a little bit humorous at times. Now, in the 1950s, and just before 1960, the North Country had at least one resident physician in each community. Moore's had Dr. Aaron Davis, Champlain had Henry Van Acker. Henry Van Acker came to Champlain in 1940 to replace Dr. George Gagne, who moved to Plattsburgh. And, uh, had practiced there for several years after that. And Harris, Clare, and Ross's point. Now, with George Clark here at Chase. Now, by 1960, Dr. Davis vacated his Moore's office and went to work in Plattsburgh at the hospital, uh, physician's hospital, to practice anesthesia. Dr. Van Acker moved to Albany to practice, to, to work for the state. And Dr. Sclare moved to Plattsburgh, thinking that he, he had learned something about cardiology. He, he's quite uh, adept at electrical uh, involvement of the cardiac rhythm. And he'd written a book about it, which was actually pretty darn accurate. And he decided he could be a cardiologist and moved to Plattsburgh. So, left here was one resident physician. Now, there were a number of people that saw Dr. Yves Langlois from Quebec and a lot of people from the Rosset Point area saw the two Dr. Pratt's in Albert, who's a Dr. Robert, they're both Robert Pratt's. But essentially, Dr. Clark was the only physician, resident physician, in all of the North Country, North of Plattsburgh. Okay. It was um, interesting that uh, most physicians at that time, and there's another uh, aspect of this not being cordial. A lot of physicians, way back, I'm talking about knowing about or knowing of, not really personally knowing of that far back, but in the early 1900s and the late 1800s, solo physicians were the way. And there were a couple of reasons for that. Medical schools taught anatomy and pathology. Pathology meaning what happens to the body when you get a disease or whatever. But as far as treatment and remedies were concerned, there were not many specific, this is the way you do it. You learn certain disciplines or methods, depending on what, you know, we go back to bloodletting and uh, all sorts of physics and things to clean out or whatever. Uh, but a lot of people did not have a standard. A lot of doctors didn't. So in a community, if you had this way of taking care of your patients, it might not be similar to somebody else coming in. So you didn't really welcome somebody else coming in. And uh, that gradually changed over a period of time. But even in my time, in the early 50s and late 40s, uh, the two doctors in my, in Champlain, they, uh, Calvin wants me to be careful about names here, so I'll be careful. <laughs> anyway, they lived four houses apart, and they were not very cordial to each other. In fact, one of the doctor's mother-in-law was the wife of a pediatrician in Plattsburgh, and she would look up the street and say, George, so-and-so has six more cars in his yard than you do. What's the matter with your practice? What's going on here? Why aren't you doing better? And it's true. It was a, uh, 
it happened. So, uh, but you know, as time went on and treatments became more standard, uh, then it was uh, the way to go. Then was to you know get coverage when you could and have somebody available to take care of your patient. I uh, jumped ahead there, but that's all right. <laughs> The other thing about physicians, uh, I'm skipping in here a little bit, but physicians that are farther away uh, than Champlain, I'm talking about now Moores, Moores Forks. At one time, there were a number of physicians, one physician per 100 people. This was back in the 1800s and then early 1900s. Medical school. I guess could be entered and uh, a degree gotten without a whole lot of uh, extra work. Maybe. anecdotes about patients. And some of you may have heard this one before, but I'll go over it anyway. Uh, we got, I got called one time to see a patient that was off about 300, 400 yards east of Route 9 on the dirt road. And I went to see her. And when I got out of my car, I saw this cloud of dust coming down <coughs> the driveway. And underneath that cluster of us was Dr. Clark's Cadillac. <laughs> so he got there the same time I did. And uh, he said, did she call you? And I said, yes. And I said, uh, would you go see it now? He said, uh, two things. She had no reason to call both of us. <laughs> and I can guarantee you that her complaint will not justify either one of us seeing her. <laughs> so if I go in there, she's going to hear about it. <laughs> so you go see her. I said, okay, I'll go see her. <laughs> so I went in and see her, and then I said, you know, next time you call, maybe you ought to call just Dr. Clark and be patient. He'll get here to see you. And anyway, he turned around and went off. He wasn't out to call. <laughs> I had just a couple of others, too, to tell you about. This fellow lived on River Street in Champlain. We don't have anybody. Yes, we do have one house, one or two houses left on River Street. Anyway, Oliver, I won't give him his last. I won't give his last name, Calvin. <laughs> Oliver. Anyway, I used to go see him about every three or four months, maybe a little bit longer. He had some arthritic problems in his knees, and even back then, and to say we were giving steroid shots for the knees, but would really help people with arthritic knees for you know up to six months. And we were charging six dollars for a house call. Mm -hmm. And one time I went and I said, you know. Oliver, you got to charge you an extra dollar for the shot. He said, give me this shot, the next call will go to Dr. Clark, I won't have you back to see me again. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, let's put that in context. At that time, our office fees were four dollars and then went up gradually to five dollars. But the laborers at Sheridan Ironworks were making a dollar and a quarter an hour. So to come to our office, and be seen for 15 or 20 minutes for four dollars. That meant, you know, three and a half hours work or, you know, that, that was an expense for them. And I'll tell you, most of these people paid on the spot. They didn't go and see a doctor or they didn't ask your advice or seek your care if they didn't have the money to pay for it. So <clears throat> that was the one. There was another one, a lady from uh, Jay-Z that I, she had, I, I think the reason she called me, well, she told me this. She used to buy coal from my father. My father used to have a coal business and wood and whatever. So she bought coal from him and thought maybe that I, I would probably be just as kind to her as my father was. <laughs> but I went to see her. Uh, she looked at me and I took care of her and I went back and she said, you know, uh, Dr. Clark is closer by. 
And you really didn't help me anyways. <laughs> 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 Several others, but one more. This lady came in <laughs> from Jay Z, and she said she'd been to see Dr. Clark, and she held out her hand with a whole handful of pills. She says, "I cannot take all these pills," and I told him that, and he said to me, "That's the way I practice medicine, and this is what's necessary for you." She said, "I'm not going back to him. I can't handle all those pills." So, gradually, I think I kind of decrease some of them. And one time, maybe six or eight months later, she came back to me, handful of pills again that you're giving me, you're, I'm no better off, she said, I still got a handful of pills to take. So, but she, I, I guess she decided that she'd stay, but anyway, she was concerned, and yeah, a lot of people are taking a lot of different medicines or whatever. Oh. Clark must have fit the school in, in between all that, too. What's that? He must have fit the school in yeah. with his physical. Yes, he did. Uh, and he was uh, uh, also very adept at keeping up with what was happening. He uh, read regularly, I know that, and used to go to Montreal to conferences. Thursday night conferences were uh, held at McGill and they were geared toward family practitioners, put on by a number of different specialists that really uh, helped us out a lot. And he was very, very uh, adept at going there. He wouldn't, there was one thing he wouldn't do, and I asked him about this, there became a difference between general practice and family practice. And the difference had to do with examinations. And if you took an examination, and actually, uh, family practice specialty was one of the <coughs> first specialties, and we called ourselves specialists then when we got that term, family practice. I don't know if it was worthy or not, but anyway, we got it. And you could take an examination, and you had to recertify yourself every six years, and you became a diplomat, in a sense, in that family practice uh, specialty. <coughs> what did it mean? Well, it meant that you had to continue postgraduate uh, education, 50 hours a year, plus other uh, reading and conferences. And then every five to six years, you have to take a recertification exam. The first exams were not too difficult because you were new <coughs> in the block and you knew what was going on, but they keep up with everything. And uh, I remember taking those and uh, sitting there and going over and over and seeing the young residents come out of medical school or residency mm -hmm. and they're up halfway through the exam handing in their papers and I'm sitting there. I say, well, more power to you. So I'd stay till the end. But he didn't feel it was necessary to prove to anybody that he was confident and that he was keeping up with it. And he, I'm sure, was right. No question about that. Uh, let me uh, now get into some of the changes that uh, <coughs> have come about in the, well, he started in 48 and I started in 63. So you can put the numbers together and you, most of you will probably already realize the number of changes that have taken place. But just to take, I'll, I'll go down each specialty and give you an example, or give you examples of this. Cardiology, when I first came to town, we took care of, I know Dr. Clark did too, I would took care of patients with heart attacks at home, with heart failure. And was this malpractice? Well, 
And there were two reasons, and I've already stated one of them. A lot of these people refused to go to the hospital. And we didn't have any coronary care unit. Prior to 1964, there were no heart units in this area. In 1964, Dr. Al Walker started the first coronary care unit at the CB hospital in Plattsburgh. And that was a, a really a major step in bringing cardiac care into a, a capacity where it should be. The defibrillators, uh, which were only then in the hospital. First experience that I had with uh, that type of, of, was when I was a resident intern in Waterbury, Connecticut. I was fortunate to have this fellow named Ed Palumbo. Ed Palumbo had a great big guy, he could have been a tight end or maybe a uh, defensive end on some football, like this, and he talked that way too. Anyway, he had a withered arm. He was born with a brachial palsy, and this comes about usually when you're born, the cord, the umbilical cord is wrapped around your shoulder to a point where it impinges a nerve, and you get partial paralysis of an arm. So he's like this, but he's got the strength in this hand, but he can't do very much but his left hand. But he was very innovative, and he was one of the first, in fact, the first person to start what's called a code unit in the state of Connecticut. This was in Waterbury. And he decided that this was going to be, have to be. So to get into that, he was concerned that patients with heart attacks were not properly taken care of because they were put on the regular floor, just like here when I first came to Plattsburgh. All heart attack double patients were put on the standard floor, regular floor. So he set up, made sure that heart, heart attack patients were near the corridor, and he stole two monitors from the operating room. Uh, I know he didn't go up and ask for it. He just brought them down. He's that type of person. We need him down here. So we would hook them up in the corridor, and he would have them hooked up to the patients so the nurses going by could see what the rhythms were. Now, we didn't have a lot of anti-arrhythmic medications back then, but we had some. And it was a benefit to the patients to be able to find, obviously, to find those things out. And then he decided we ought to be able to get to the patient on the floor that was having a spell that hadn't necessarily been brought in with a heart attack. So we set up this rolling cart, which many of you probably already know about, in the hospital. These are cold. cold. Uh, we didn't have all of sophisticated medicines that there are now, but we had some. And, uh, he was, not only that, but he, he, he decided, uh, for instance, I'm jumping around here, but forgive me. Anyway, he decided that there is a condition in newborns of too much bilirubin, too much bile in the blood. And if that bilirubin gets up to a certain level, it can cause brain damage. So what pediatricians were doing, even back then, was exchanging the blood on the newborn so the blood would be less likely to have bilirubin. So he's deciding, and this is before dialysis, there ought to be a way when people come in with some poisons, like the biggest ones back then and isn't unusual now was Tylenol. They come in, we should be able to exchange the blood on adults that came in and I'm saying, I don't think anybody's <laughs> going to approve of that. But really says we ought to consider it because these people were dying of liver failure because of too much Tylenol. We could save them. Uh, as far as I know, that never got off the ground, but this is the type of guy he was. He was always thinking ahead and trying to be innovative in a lot of different ways. Uh, how did I get off on him? Well, I guess because of the fact that this was something that I knew a little bit about before I came here. But, you know, going from CCU to uh, going from patient on the floor with a heart attack to a coronary care unit, you all know what that difference is. That made it made such a difference, and what's happened with our uh, emergency medical service through the years. Uh, when I first started again, we had well-meaning first aid people on the ambulances, but we didn't have any medications. I knew how to intubate, but I maybe did it twice or two or three times. So I was nowhere near as proficient. It's a type of a procedure that you've got to do in order to keep proficient. 
So he uh, he learned how to. Uh, well, we learned that uh, as it went along here, and then all the different medications that uh, the ambulance crews are able to give now to literally save lives on the way to the hospital. There have been examples, maybe not that many, but how many examples does it make in order to prove your worth? And if it's once or twice a year. Then. So, uh, so cardiac pulmonary care, that's another thing that's advanced. There were no pulmonary lung specialists when I first came to town. And at that time, when a patient <coughs> had trouble breathing, we usually used a nebulizer or what we call bird treatment. They were positive pressure breathing. But that didn't ventilate or give enough oxygen to a number of people. A lot of people that had severe lung disease that could be helped didn't really do that well because they needed to be in an intensive care unit with a tube in, ventilator on, and then monitoring, checking what's going on in their system, the blood gases, and, uh, and that, was, that wasn't done back then. Uh, gastroenterology, uh, you know, that, that's been a, 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 a specialty that's taken up. When I first came to town, we had no uh, gastroenterology specialist. My, uh, uh, I had learned as an intern and a resident to do liver biopsies, find out what's going on in the liver. And I was the only one locally that did liver biopsies outside of the abdominal operation where surgeons could go at the liver once they were in, in the abdomen. Uh, I have to tell you, kind of a, uh, not a good situation that happened to me when I did a liver biopsy. I, maybe some of you heard this before. My neighbor, farmer, he had abnormal liver function studies, didn't drink, uh, but he was around a lot of chemicals and cleaning his milkers and things. And I was worried about it, so I said, uh, we've got to get a liver biopsy in. I can't leave. I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. You go in the hospital in the evening. I'll do the liver biopsy that night. We'll watch you overnight and we'll get you home the next morning. Okay, so we agreed to do that. Lo and behold, when I did the liver biopsy, I got his gallbladder, so I'm pulling out bile rather than liver, and there's nothing much more painful than a patient having bile peritonitis. It's the worst type of a chemical irritant or any kind of irritant that can irritate the peritoneum. And he was there. He was in the hospital for three or four. Fortunately, he survived. And uh, two things he didn't do. He didn't get angry at me, and he didn't have a good lawyer either. <laughs> <laughs> Surgery. Uh, you know, the surgeons in our town, when I first came, we had some technically excellent surgeons. Uh, but just think of what's uh, uh, laparoscopy that's come about, so that a lot of people can have operations without having an open operation. Uh, different procedures that are done now. Uh, and back to uh, the gastroenterologist, you know, we were able to do the lower end of the bowel examination, but not the full. So we weren't picking up early cancers back then the way it's possible to do it now. I realize that this doesn't happen <coughs> all the time. It's successful, obviously. Uh, and Radiology, my goodness. Plain x-rays when I first came. You could do barium studies to check the stomach and the bowel x-ray, but now the scans and the MRIs, and uh, you can pinpoint. Uh, uh, I'll give you a personal example. Maybe it's not appropriate, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> About six weeks ago, six or eight weeks ago, I had a bellyache. I was sure I had appendicitis. So I was, uh, I told my wife, Joanna, I get the, get my old knife out and I'll see if they'll use it and I'll see if Foley wants to do an appendectomy on it. I got down the operating, uh, the, uh, the emergency room and I didn't have, I had called a ischemic 
because the CAT scan showed it. And the CAT scan is pretty darn accurate in telling whether it's appendicitis or not. You know, of all the diseases that we encounter, one of the most common is <coughs> appendicitis, but it's not always possible to be accurate. So, but the CAT scan does. Um, but those, those are some of the advances that, that I've seen over the years. Uh, I'll stop for a minute, ask for questions, and then go on to some anecdotal things. Uh, more patients if you're interested. Can you tell us about the change when, when you, as general practitioners, stopped uh, delivering babies? Yeah. Well, that... <laughs> Stop delivering babies and stop taking care of heart attacks and everything in between. Mm -hmm. You know, the comp it's so difficult today for anybody to come into general practitioner, to become a general practitioner, and expect that you can do any justice to obstetrics because it's not only complicated, but it can be very complicated. So it's rare, if ever, you will see anybody come into family practice and deliver babies anymore. I suppose if there's a time and a need, yes. But uh, not because of the monitoring of the baby and uh, uh, all the different uh, aspects of it. You, you just can't, you can't do it. Uh, and again, I said everything in between that and heart attacks, we can't. Uh, it's not justifiable for family practitioners to take care of heart attacks anymore. Uh, I can remember when I first started, and there's two examples of people that I remember that I took care of, there were several others, get a call, and again, the patient that refused to go to the hospital was in profound congestive heart failure. Morphine and a, a chemical called mercurhydrin. Mercurhydrin is a mercurial diuretic. It's not a poison. I suppose it could be done. But we used to sit there and shoot morphine in. Now the morphine wasn't to make somebody loopy, out of control. It actually had an effect on clearing the congestion, the lungs. And I don't think to this day anybody knows really why, but it worked. And sit there, and you could sit there, I did, I remember, uh, a couple of hours and watching it work. And seeing how, what a marvel it was. Get somebody who is uh, in such distress, respiratory, breathing problems, give them morphine, give it time, pretty soon they're calm. They're not just calm because of the, of the drug, they're calm because they're breathing better. It's helping with the fluid. There was one other fluid that we had available, but it was an intravenous uh, diuretic, which is no longer available, but it helped back then. But you, you can't can't do that. There was another instance of another woman had the same situation. Get the morphine, wait a while. Sometimes it would be enough to say, well, she's going to be all right, but it's going to take a couple of hours. Go home, get an hour's sleep, come back. And it would, I, look, I'm not alone in this. I'm sure George Clark had plenty of that experience. Uh, but it was something that you did. John, why don't you tell us about barter? Did anybody ever bring you any good barter you know, <laughs> for payment? Barters? <laughs> Not like George Clark. George, was, George had a corner on that with whatever. You know, I guess he had special pies and special cakes. The bartering came, uh, one example, there's a lot of them, but there's one example of a family I used to take care of in Hemingford, Quebec. We used to go across the border, too, and I'm sure he did. Uh, I never heard, I, I know he did, I know he had patients from Canada, because he was fluent in French, you know that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was, he's embarrassed me in so many ways, and one of them is his fluency in French, and I took three years of French in high school, <laughs> another year in college, and uh, I couldn't, and work on the farm with people that spoke French, but I never could, I guess I didn't put my mind to it, whatever. But, uh, I remember going to this family, and I think the barter was not so much they were willing, but it was there. And after I'd finished seeing, there'd be a nice cup of tea and a big chocolate, piece of chocolate cake, or two, if you wanted to. Uh, 
but never actually. Uh, Chicken, firewood, no. No, no, no that's not, not no. Uh, I've had people bargain with the price. <laughs> I can tell you one story, I won't use the name because I, I'll get in trouble. Really serious trouble. As a fellow one time, he was a farmer, okay. Got hurt on his tractor, fell off his tractor, came in the office, took some x-rays, um, <clears throat> took care of him, and he didn't have anything broken, but he was pretty well banged up. So anyway, uh, it came time to settle up, he said, how much? So I said, $125, x-rays and whatever else. You write a check for $100. <laughs> That's the way I do business. <laughs> I said, I can't do business that way. He said, take it or leave it. <laughs> so I didn't take it. <laughs> but we usually get, uh, oh my goodness, uh, remember the candies that Mary Dubray used to give us from uh, Ellenberg? Oh my goodness, this time of year. <laughs> this great big box of all sorts of <coughs> fun. Uh -huh. The size of a table. Oh my goodness, there was something else. <clears throat> I don't think that was bartering, I think that was just whatever. But, <clears throat> and I think probably the same way with uh, George Clark, but he way outdid me as far as getting people to, and they probably thought, uh, because he didn't have a registered cook it, I should, I gotta be careful because my wife doesn't like me to call her the cook. <laughs> <laughs> call her anything else. But he didn't have, so that, I'm sure they felt sorry for him, that he was under nurse, well he, I don't think he was under nurse, but they felt sorry for him. <clears throat> Susie and I read hundreds of letters that he wrote home, either from, uh, from school or from the war, uh, from his time in Europe, and he always talked about food, so <laughs> that was definitely a way to his heart. <laughs> well, I think so, right? <laughs> Oh my. You said earlier that there would never be uh, family doctors that go, what do you call them, to the house? Uh, house calls. There would never be house calls again. Why, well, why do you think that, you know, so many other things go full circle? Why won't that? I think that's probably for two reasons. There should be. In fact, What's the story? I'm glad you brought that up. Anyway, to learn about people, go visit them. It's such fascination. My fascination in medicine, of course, try to find out what's wrong with somebody and then try to help them. But to learn about human nature, because we're all so darn different. Well, you know, not that different, but we are. And to learn about people, there's nothing more fascinating than I can we had a minister one time. See if you get me off on it. So, anyway, we had a minister one time. He said, if anybody wants to see me or has a problem, they come to the church. They can see me or come to my office. I said, you want to learn about people? Go visit them. You don't have to be nosy. Just look around. You will learn a whole lot about that person. Well, he wasn't interested. So I said, well, that's too bad. Because it is. It is. Uh, but a lot of physicians now, it's time. You know, well, I will tell you, it's too bad. We base what we do on a time clock now. Uh, I never paid, I, I should have, but I have, again, good staff that would say, hey, John, too long, too long, move on, move on. But they, uh, to justify whatever Okay, I'll use it. Whatever fee you're going to get from whatever, you have to put down how much time you spent doing what for a patient. <coughs> and if you're going to gear yourself to that, and it's necessary because, you know, of all sorts of expenses, whatever. So you have to really come to grips with that. But that should not do away with somebody going to visit. Uh, most people feel today, though, there are ambulances to bring you there. If you can't come to the office, go to the emergency room or uh, have the visiting nurse go by and see what's wrong and then 
when you have some family member that's available, have them bring you in and we'll make arrangements. So I think it's just a matter of circumstance. And it's kind of sad, but I'm old. I can say that. Mm -hmm. so, uh, nursing home patients. Uh, that's, and I, I told you what, he, what Dr. Clark felt. He was going to see his patients every week. They paid him okay if they didn't? Okay. He thought they ought to be seen every week. Well, sometimes they didn't need to be, but he felt they should be, and he felt his presence there, which really is still important. You have to have that uh, that feeling the patient knows that you care. So I said to my granddaughter, I said, you know, it's, you got to have that feeling. And if you don't have it, you don't belong in this business. If you want to call it a business. Some more uh, anecdotes. I went to visit a fellow in uh, Moore's. And the family asked me to go see him. He's in his 90s. This is well, a long time ago. So I had my black bag, pretty good sized black bag. And I went in the house and I knocked on the door. He said, come in. So he said, put your suitcase right there. Sit down. And uh, we'll decide what your chores are going to be, and then I'll take you to your room with your suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, all the time, he's behind this newspaper, and then he starts reading the newspaper. And I look over, and it's upside down. <laughs> and he's reading every line like it's an exact line. And finally, he turned around with a smirk on his face. Yeah, I said, I guess you come to check me, didn't you? <laughs> but I heard he did that to a lot of people. He'd go to the barbershop, hold that newspaper up, upside down, and read. Read it at all. <laughs> I don't know if um, I told part of this before about uh, Emil and uh, Bella. I can use their first names, right, Calvin? You're okay with that? Anyway, there were a couple that uh, had no children, and uh, she pretty much ruled the rules, but that's all right, too. Uh, uh, she called me one night, this probably was in the evening, late evening, and I knew her pretty well, and that's what I said before, get to know your patients, and then you know what to expect when they tell you what's wrong, most of the time, you can't always be exact. But you can find little clues if they start differently or tell you different symptoms or whatever. You've got to know this. You've got to, you've got to take time to learn that. But anyway, she called me and I determined it wasn't anything significant. And I, well, once in a while we get tired. So I was tired. And I, I went to sleep. Next day I went to see her. Oh boy, she was fit to be tired. She was ranting and raving. She says, you know, there was a Dr. Taylor here in Morris, and he always came when I called him, or when my family called him. This was a little bit before her time. She was about 90, well, she wasn't 90, she was in her 80s. But anyway, and she said, you know what? That man was so dedicated <coughs> that, you know how he died? I said, no, I don't. In the middle of the winter, he was horse and sleigh, he couldn't get up somebody's driveway, so he got out, he started walking up, and he dropped dead in the driveway. That's a real doctor. <laughs> 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 and she's serious. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, there was, uh, uh, in wars, I told you, some time ago that at one time there were a number of doctors that were equal to one doctor per hundred people. And in Morris Forks at one time there was this Dr. Taylor, two brothers, Dr. Jim and Owen O'Neill. And uh, they, it was interesting because both of them looked upon Dr. Hunsinger, who was a doctor in West JZ, as their mentor. But when they finished training, for some reason or other, they didn't go back to work with him, nor did they work with each other when they were in Morris Ford. They worked separately. Um, 
And I, you know, I would think, again, I, that you would expect more of that camaraderie, but it wasn't to be. And I don't know why, except for what I told you, different disciplines, different methods were kind of the rule. Um, I don't know if anybody heard me before talk about this, Dr. Owen O'Neill. Dr. Owen O'Neill's wife was still alive when I came back to practice in Champlain and got to know her and got to see her before she died. And then her son, Harold O'Neill, uh, he dictated a tape about what he remembered about his father. And it's interesting because he tells about, uh, uh, well, some of these are anecdotal, but he tells about this one story. Maybe you guys, have, maybe some of you have heard this before. But he got, he, he, he had uh, a special horse that he said nobody in the North Country could beat. And while he was out riding with his horse one day, his old Model T went by him. It wasn't old, it was new. He said, my goodness, if there's some vehicle that can go faster than my horse, I'm going to get it. So he got himself a Model T. Well, he stopped at McDowell's store in Moore's Forks that I think was in the same place where Goodrich's store was. And he needed some oil for the car. So he went into the uh, store and he had whoever was tending the counter give him some oil for the car. So he got it, poured it in the crankcase of the car, went up the road, and all of a sudden the car just chugged, 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 and came to the stop. So, so he called a friend of his, a mechanic, to come and help him tow it away or try to help out. So the first thing that the mechanic did was take the dipstick out of the crankcase of the car. He says, that's molasses. Who gave you molasses? <laughs> 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 that's molasses rather than oil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, and he tells about uh, his main, it's interesting, he said his father's main income in Moore's Forks was working for the state and doing school physicals. Because people just didn't have, well, I understand that. And he said uh, they would not be able to pay even his 50 cents or whatever it was. Uh, I, you you got to appreciate that. I, I think that's understandable. <coughs> so, you know, I've talked a little bit about the uh, the improvement of ambulance EMS care. Most of you probably are well aware of what they do and how well they're trained and the amount of work that they put into their uh, their service. And it's, uh, uh, it, to me, it's been a that and emergency room doctors. Because when we first, when I first came to town, there were no emergency room doctors. And there was no such thing as triage in the emergency room either, which is now prevalent. Uh, but there were actually one or two physicians in the area that were uh, against having emergency, hired emergency room physicians. They felt, and it's a selfish, I'd say it's a selfish attitude, for fear that they were going to lose patients. They wanted to have their patients call them when they got to the emergency room, of course, to, and they would go see them. Well, I can tell you one thing. It's, it's simple uh, logistics. Up in Champlain, a patient of mine gets to the emergency room. I'm not there, and somebody in the emergency room as well is able to take care of them. You want that patient taken care of. So that was a boom. Uh, to our, and then to have, uh, and as we had in Champlain, hired emergency medical technicians and emergency medical service is just a, 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 a and you have to give credit to, to people that were um, had the vision of set these things up like Ken LaPlante 
And that, that was a, a problem because there were a number of people in our area that were resistant to that. Why? I don't know. But it works out and it's done well. People cringe what they see at the cost of an ambulance call. But when you realize the cost of the ambulance, the technicians, and everything that's involved, realize that it isn't just money that's going to be saved. You have to keep ahead and make sure that you have enough uh, capital reserve to buy the next equipment. Well, at one time, before they had what the sophisticated ambulance service we had now, it was the undertakers that would Clark, Clark's Clark's the, would bring them in the act when they're... The hearse. Well, you know, you know Teresa, I, I, I've said... I've written in it, I know. <laughs> Oral used to pick me up to help him on an accident. Yeah, he did. And that was good. That's what I said, Bob. That we did have good uh, first aiders mm -hmm. that could help out. I remember going and doing uh, one time in Ross's Point, having to do a tracheostomy on a patient that was in an accident. He couldn't breathe, and there was an obstruction here. So, they, and you can say, well, well, that was quite a procedure. Well. It's actually, it's like anything else. You know how to do something, it does, it goes along pretty easily. Crawling into, crawling into trucks that were tipped over to start oxygen or to start an IV uh, before the... Every village had someone they could call on. It was Margaret Sifford. I mean, yeah. She was the visiting nurse for the North Country for many years in Florence Vedette. They were the ones that were called for accidents. Uh, and Oral would pick them up. But they had no equipment there whatsoever. No, that's it. But, you know, we could, uh, it, was, it might be skills. that you could transport a patient to the hospital that was in dire straits and wait there and maybe bring them back. Mm. Not quite alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we did with what we could. What are you laughing at? Not quite a lot. Not quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the weather yeah. must have been quite a challenge for you all back then, too, with the mm -hmm. transporting and just making the house call. Uh, it, uh, I enjoyed the weather. Mm -hmm. In fact, <laughs> if it was a stormy day, uh, it would be very, very, it would be very <laughs> Joe Juno. I'd say, well, you know, I think we should go off here. And see so and so on the, uh, the road. It wasn't the Bush Road. It was further down the Candace Corners Road. Mm -hmm. And oh my God, you would pick this day. And I said, Well, it's time we went there anyway. And there was a challenge of the weather that mm -hmm. was kind of uh, not the safest thing. But yeah, the weather could be a problem. I remember one Did you time. Ever get stuck? Huh? Did you ever get stuck on the way to or from someplace in the snow or mud or something? Well, yeah, no. That's good. I remember taking a snow sled one time when we had a storm. This was in 1972. It was a big storm in the air. In fact, we took in some people in our house that were uh, uh, stranded. And I got stranded first in Rosset Point. We got out of there, it was at the nursing home. And somebody that was just north of me called, and it, you know, there were drifts you couldn't get over. So I took a snow sled and went off the sea and was having trouble breathing. And, Took care of him, I guess. I hope. <laughs> you know, right? Anyway, on the way back, I went over the snow drift, and as I came down, the weight on the handlebar broke the handlebar. Oh, my snow so, uh, <laughs> yes. No, you talked about barter. Yeah. Doctor George Allen, remember him? Oh yes. I remember people who said. Paid his house or pay off his bill. <laughs> well, that was good. Uh, well, it wasn't easy, as I said, when, well, you heard me say, $4 for an office visit, but making a dollar and a quarter an hour job. Uh, it took a while. And Dr. Fanacker. 
you had a, an ingrown toenail, you got the great bills. But if you had a migraine, you had the great bills too. <laughs> the big joke is great pills during everything. Yeah, but, but, it, but the cause of that was you had the bug. Uh, his favorite thing, you have the bug. You have broken well, leg, you have the bug. You know, that's what I said in the beginning. Uh, the, there were uh, methods, disciplines that people learn from whatever that they practice. And uh, I remember asking one of the doctors in our area, it wasn't Dr. Clark, about how he could justify doing what he did when that wasn't a specific treatment. He said, you know, I don't falsify or say that I'm giving a cure for whatever. I'm there for that patient. And he or she knows that I'm there and doing the best I can. The actual specific remedy may or may not have any bearing on how that person gets better. Mind over matter. Well, mind over matter and, 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 and faith uh, in somebody that you think is doing the best to try to take care of you. That was the big joke. What's that? All oh, those pills? The great pills, yeah. The great pills cured everything. Well, and then he's known that doctor visit you the doctor had probably about five or six, probably ten bottles of pills in his bag. And a little envelope, he'd give you five, six pills, and that was it. I don't know what they were in most of those pills, but that was usually a cure-all, whatever you have. <laughs> were, you, were your first offices, or even Dr. Clark's before you, in your homes? Or did, were they in a separate place, at well, site? No. Uh, tell you a little story about that too. Uh, when uh, I told you about when Dr. Clark was alone here, 1960 to 62, uh, a prime example of combined services of three communities it wasn't Chasey, but it was Moore's, Rossa Point, Champlain. That together decided nobody has a physician here. Uh, we had Dr. Clark and Jay Z and Dr. Langmaier said in, in Quebec and Dr. Pratt in Albert. But what can we do? So this is when they came about with the idea of the medical center that I came to in 1963. Um, and that was primarily, I would see people at home. Um, that one day, somebody came to the door and it was Wednesday afternoon. Uh, my schedule was this. I, this is when I was alone. Uh, office in the morning, and in the beginning I didn't go to the hospital except for deliveries, and I only had a very few, I didn't have many of those. But Wednesday afternoon was a time when I went to sleep for a couple of hours. And uh, the way my wife would say, uh, phone would ring and she'd say, she didn't tell people that I was off on a call or whatever. She says, he's taking a nap and he needs his sleep. I'll take your number. He'll call you back when he wakes up. <laughs> well, she's like that. <laughs> she is. So, but one day, somebody came to the door. Afternoon, Wednesday afternoon. And she says, I uh, heard her not sleeping, kind of dozing. She said, um, well, this is afternoon off. Well, I didn't plan to get sick on Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> it just happened. I got to see him. Well, I think she didn't actually feel that she met her match, because I don't remember no more than she ever met her match. <laughs> anyway, she, never, she finally said, well, I'll wait a minute, and because I heard this, so I got up and took care of whatever was wrong. Occasionally, but most of the time, it was um, in the office, mm -hmm. in our office. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had our phone hooked up to the office too. So when I left the office, turned the switch on, she answered the phone. You had a dedicated line. It wasn't a party line. No, it was the same line. Same line that was uh, in the office. Mm -hmm. Same line, hooked it up. So you grew up in this area. Yes. And you went away to medical school. Yeah. And then. 
the community built the medical center, or how did you get back and how did, how did you get to the medical center? The community built the medical center in 1962, and uh, Everybody paid so much. yeah, there were five, four different ways that the, it was financed. People gave, donated. There was a loan, and there were people that uh, that uh, planned a loan, loaned themselves, and were paid back. Right, sure. So uh, there was a Dr. Schultheis that yeah, came yes. on board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were here from 61, 60 to 63. 50, right there? 60. 60. 60. 60. Yeah. The medical center opened in 62, but he came a little bit before. Mm -hmm. And there was supposed to be a Dr. Benoit from Canada was supposed to be with him too, but he never showed up. So when I came on board in 63, I really wanted or asked or hoped that he would stay because he's a good physician and he shouldn't be. Well, but it wasn't his wish he moved out as soon as I came. Uh, and then I was alone for two years and Dr. Starr came in 65 and the scene in 81. So uh, it wasn't, uh, it was okay. And one time, we had four physicians, and I thought the whole area really required five physicians plus extenders, nurse practitioners, uh, physician's assistants, could really, uh, really take that number to do justice to, to the needs of the community. And I think it's still that way. And I'm hoping that it'll regenerate again with this new practice. You just can't get people to come into the country. There are two reasons for it. Uh, one is, the work ethic itself, and you know, I mentioned a little bit about people going out on solo, but the trend now is self-preservation, which is okay. You go into practice, you're willing to give your time, but you want time off to regenerate the brain and the body and to spend time with whatever else, family, whatever else. And that's a natural process, I think. So, that's the, ten, uh, the, the trend now. Uh, it, when when um, I first came, I tried to get people to visit, see if they were interested. Uh, people coming up New York City, I remember two different people thought they wanted to come up here and relax and take it easy. <laughs> I said, whoa, I've seen that's that. probably not so going to happen. <laughs> I wasn't as blunt as uh, 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 as, as Joanne would be, but anyway, I try to be. I try to be because she tells it like it is, and that's good. That helps me. Helps me a lot. Anyway, uh, they decided obviously not to come. But when George Starr came, his reason for coming was that he was fluent in French, and he knew there was a French population here, and he wanted to continue to practice speaking French. He didn't want to lose that. So that was one of the main reasons he came. Mm -hmm. uh, Tell me, when you were, before you came back to Champlain, you and your wife, you looked at other hospitals, right? Thirteen other places. Right. And I remember that number. Not like it's the odd number, mm -hmm. but when I finished and decided, Joanne said, you never had any other idea but then to go back to Champlain. Why did we waste our time going to all these other communities? I don't know. Where was Champlain? Maine. Same type of community, kind of lateral. It's a small community that's about, yeah, about the size of Champlain, maybe. Yeah, just about the size of Champlain. How'd I meet her? You're going to ask me how I met her. I've told this story a hundred times. You're going to have to listen to it again, though. Uh, when I was in college, I uh, had an English professor who uh, totally disagreed on how I interpreted poetry. So I said, well, that's what I see. He said, well, that's not what's there. I said, well, that's what I see. So he invited me to his office one day to discuss this. And uh, we got tangled a little bit. I guess maybe back then, and maybe any time, I could really fester up a little bit of 
steam. Anyway, mm -hmm. he decided that uh, I just didn't know what I was doing. So I got a 50 at the end of the year in the course. Mm -hmm. As I called on my mother, well, I said, no way that I'm ever going to get into medical school with a 50. And uh, my mother, who was kind of the pusher, said, well, if it's not to be, it's not to be. And I was surprised to hear her say that. So I said, well, maybe I ought to take it. Makeup course, so I did. I went to the University of New Hampshire, and I stayed with an aunt of mine who lived in this little place called South Borough, Maine. I said, "Are there any uh, single women here?" <laughs> <laughs> well, they thought about it, and pretty soon a cousin of mine said, "Yeah, we know somebody." So that was 1954. <laughs> the rest is what history, huh? But um, yeah, she said, "No way, you were going any other place." And it's been good. Mm -hmm. I have no regrets. But you know, that's another thing. I asked Dr. Clark, I got to see him quite a little bit just before he died. And I enjoyed his company. Very bright, bright person. You know, very well read and a good speaker and good, you know, just a bright person. And we used to talk about different things. But we talked about one thing. Would you do it again? He said, no. And I'm saying, why well, your whole life in medicine here? Uh, and he said, you know why? Because the same situation we're here now would be here if I started all over again. It's just not a good environment to practice medicine. Not the people, but the overseers, the people that control your way of what you're doing. You don't think of it that way, but in a sense, little things happen, you lose control. And I don't think that he, and he was pretty serious about that. I said, well, what would you do? He said, I once thought teaching was a good profession. I said, well, but you've been such a good physician, and patients love you. And I said, how could you not want to go back if you were at all cognizant of what you had in the previous life? How could you not go back? No, he said, I wouldn't want to be because of circumstances, actually, it's just, uh, which surprised me. When did you realize that you wanted to be a doctor? How old were you? Uh, uh, four years old. Before? Four? Four years old. You know. They were dissecting a cat. Uh, <laughs> no, I wasn't dissecting a cat. I was driving my little pedal car, and I had Dr. Allen, George Allen was our doctor. And he used to come to the house. If he heard that you were sick and nobody called, he'd go anyway. <laughs> so he came to the house one time. My mother said, what are you doing here? Well, I heard he was sick. Got to see him. So uh, that and uh, I had a little dog. What has that got to do with medicine? But anyway, the little dog <laughs> climbed up the cellar stairs. And in the middle of the night, turned around, fell down, and unfortunately broke his neck. Dog wasn't dead, so I picked the dog up, put it in my wagon, and I said to my mother, I want you to call Dr. Allen. He's not going to want to see this. No. Well, I want you to call him. And I fussed to the point that he came. Well, he wasn't very happy about coming. <laughs> but the fact that he came to see my dog said, I want to be a doctor. So I had my father write Dr. Allen on the back of this car. And my mother said, you can't put Dr. Allen there. I said, yes, I can. Mm -hmm. So I think it was as far back as that. Well, I think I, mm -hmm. there, were, there were times when I thought differently, but mm -hmm. I have not been disappointed. Was there any other job that you ever, ever thought of doing in your lifetime? I mean, I know you were young to think you'd want to be a doctor, but <coughs> is there anything you like would do? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'll leave that to Grant said John. How's that? You can see that, right? Um, well, does it sound kind of different? I love the farm. I like the farmer. Uh, you know, cows and taking care of cows, and even in a loose hay out in the field, there was nothing. I, I used to, that was my job, and uh, nobody likes to be up in the hay mow, but I like being up out in the field with a hay loader and making a load of hay. It was quite a, quite an art, right? Well, you can 
put here and here and here, make sure that everything bound in. No bales in, they said bitch. No, no. My, <laughs> grand, my grandfather was uh, about uh, the last one to get a baler. And finally, did get one. Did your father or your grandfather die on the farm? My father. How old were you? 20. Just graduated, the week I graduated from medical school, so mm -hmm. 1959, 26. Mm -hmm. So you already off the farm at that Yeah. Time. But you know, what ifs? Mm -hmm. It was a Sunday afternoon, and I had stayed, because I was graduating from medical school that next week, and I stayed there for that week just because of the transition going into the graduation. And if I'd been home, I would have gone out and gotten the cows. You know how we think mm -hmm. what ifs? You can't live your life that way. You cannot do that. But I thought of that for years. I said, I've been there. Well, maybe. And the reason I say that, why would that bull have not gone after me? Well, my father was deaf, and I, from what I can understand, the bull came up behind him and stomped him, knocked him down and stomped him. So I don't know that it would have made any difference, but, you know, I thought about that for a while. But, like I try to tell patients, you cannot, or if, you can, but you have to understand those things happen, and life goes on like that. My old grandfather used to say, he lost three of his kids before he died, and he said, I said, how do you deal with that? He says, life, death is part of life, you got to have faith. But, oh boy, yeah. that's what I don't know. I don't know what he did. I uh, was going to talk a little bit more about the differences in the doctors uh, in the area, but I've already mentioned most of what uh, what. Uh, what they did and why they were loners, why they were soloists, why they didn't work together. And it, it still puzzles me as to why there wasn't this camaraderie that developed. Even when I first came to uh, Champlain, not in this area, as I told you, I got along well with Dr. Clark. There was no, uh, actually, no animosity there at all. But I told you about the situation in Champlain. And I saw a little bit of that in Plattsburgh, too. And there was no need for it. Because we complement each other. You don't need to be uh, feeling that somebody is intruding on your, uh, on your territory. It just isn't necessary. Did the hospital have to make agreements with the local doctors that they would give back to patients? Now? You mean about the hospitalists? I don't, I, I think it's almost on Ricky because you really can't, they can't take care of patients outpatient. The hospitalists are there to take care of inpatients. And is that a good thing? You brought that up. Is that a good thing? Mm -hmm. um, I've heard pros and cons. The, the best part of it is that you're dealing with physicians that that's all they do is take care of inpatient problems. The biggest complaint that I heard, I guess I gotta be careful about this too, is the transition of what one physician has done. And then that it reminds me of when uh, uh, <laughs> Dr. Starr, or Dr. Racine too, but he wasn't much better writer than I was. The Dr. Starr used to say to me, you know something, you see a patient, I've got to see that patient when you're not here, or maybe when you are here. And he's, uh, I can't read your writing, and I can't read your mind. You've got to print or write so that we can see what's going on, or know what's going on with that patient. So I don't know if that's the situation now, because of the transition of information from one doctor to another. <coughs> Well, now everything's on the computer. You go in, they don't look at you anymore. No. <laughs> it's hard to, though. Well, they don't. Everything on the computer. They don't look at you because they're so, it's so new. That I know. A lot of them are just, 
frozen at this computer. Well, that's just like your own kids and your grandkids. Right. They don't go face to face anymore. I don't like the color of my grandchildren's yeah. eyes are. The doctor, I go to. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor that I go to is electronic, but his computer stays in the corner, and he looks face to face this far from you through the whole examination. Wow. So so they seem to they're be still scared. out there. Yeah. And I think it's a comfort zone. I know they well, I think it's some all Some of them are too. very comfortable with electronic. Some are not. <laughs> That's what I, uh, I said to my wife some time ago, I said, you know, I can go back and do this. For two reasons. One is, you don't know squat about the computer. You can answer your email and that's about it. And you're too old. <laughs> um, one more anecdote. There, then I'll shut up. Um, so he came in one day again from Cheesy, and I took care of her and uh, asked her to come back. And she came back to see uh, George Starr. And George came to me and she said, that he said, you know the reason why she didn't come back to see you? She said, you smiled too much and she thought you weren't taking her condition seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, it's all. <laughs> but she didn't ever come back to our office either. I don't know. <laughs> well, you've mentioned or alluded to it many times how scarce physicians are in yes. this area and what are people doing and what if you know you or Dr. Clark going to try to attract? other physicians up here and can you recruit, can you get residents, um, is that not possible? Well, we've talked about both of those things, really. one of them was that we did have interest when I was still practicing, but the interest went this way, new physicians coming on board wanted to start a uh, starting salary that was more than what we were taking ourselves, and it's almost like, yes, they have these big debts to pay off, they kind of want to pay them off in the first year, and it's you know it's not possible to do that. Uh, and being isolated a little bit, people want to be in a confined situation where they have access to specialty, and and that's as I said, it's a form of self-preservation, but it's not really being selfish. It's being uh, comfortable that you you have access to whatever is available because there's such an enormous amount of information out there and you've got to be aware of these things and if you're not, you're in trouble. And then you have to be available or you have to have specialists available to help you. I think that uh, uh, are there fewer people going into medical school? <clears throat> I don't. Uh, you heard me say that Emily got in, huh? You knew that? I did hear that. Yeah. Where does she go? Uh, Louisiana State University. She lives in Baton Rouge. And that was her first choice. And what was interesting about her, she speaks fluent French. But much better than her old French. But anyway, part of her interview there, because of the Cajun population, was in French. And uh, I have an idea that may have had some bearing on her being accepted. But uh, she, she tried. She want to be a family doctor. Or She's not sure. Uh, she doesn't say one way or the other. That's the other thing. Being a specialist, it's not just because of income. It's because of knowing one part of what you're taking care of and being proficient in that. And there's no way, like we said before, you can't deliver babies. You can't take care of heart attack patients, um, severely ill patients with uh, lung problems. So. Oh, that's another story. I've told this one before, but brings it up anyway. Um, this lady was in the hospital and she was having trouble breathing. So uh, I went in to see her and uh, I was getting to the point where I needed some help. So I asked. Uh, the lung specialist, Dr. Collins, to see him. And he'd ordered some medication and a different type of inhaler. The next day I went in, she's in intensive care unit. Tubes in her, she's intubated, being ventilated, and she's looking at me. 
didn't say anything, obviously. She couldn't say anything. She had a tube in there. The next day I went in. She said, the tube's out. She said, you get out of here, you GD horse doctor. And I always felt bad about veterinarians when I was called a horse doctor. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Just say thank you. No, I should have said thank you. But I had said, okay, see you later. So I got out of here. But I hadn't ordered that, but I didn't have the time, nor right then was it appropriate for me to say, no, that wasn't my doing. So, yeah. uh, so it wasn't always, uh, everybody loves you. You, know? <laughs> you have problems. That's part of it. Yes, if you think about the number of doctors who were in this area at one time, uh, in the training that they had, and I'm talking back in the early 1900s and late 1800s, it was quite, it was uh, necessary and, and uh, uh, it, it was uh, for the most part it was quality training. But is it now, are there less people going into medicine? I don't think so. Uh, I just think there's, there's a, enough physicians, but they're concentrated away from rural areas and smaller areas. Uh, it's just more comfortable, unfortunately. My understanding is this is considered a high need area because of yeah. Well, are they more or less a specialist now in special fields rather than general practice? Well, that's what I'm saying, Bobby, is that you get to feel, you, you get to know one field well, and you're comfortable doing that. Well, what's the difference between a general practitioner and a family physician? Uh, a little bit of what I explained before, Teresa. General practitioners are still... Uh, the same as a family practice, except family practitioners are required under their specialty code to take recertification exams every five oh, or six that's, years. Okay, I didn't know if it was delivered. And they have to take a certain number of postgraduate courses every year and document that they've read a number of journals. Okay. So they're one step over a thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> but they still do. You're still allowed to do the same thing, deliver, yeah. you know, minor surgery. Of course, what you, what the surgery that you did in those days, you can't do today. Well, you can, but your insurance is so is so outrageous that you don't really for the amount of time that you would spend doing something, it doesn't warrant that. We used to do in the office, and yeah, can't you can't really justify that type of. Uh, of insurance to take care of it. Okay. Interesting. Well, I can say anybody that's that I talked to that had come across Dr. Southwick, you're greatly respected for yeah, the many well, years well. and devotion that you have. I was going to say, nobody asked me why Joanne doesn't come to these things. <laughs> Mark probably knows. Um, she says, I've heard it. Put it answers your phone. And, I've done it. Yeah. And uh, she uh, she was very good on the phone. I told you that. She just was there. And she wasn't rude. That's not her nature. Uh, but. I, you know, despite what I said to George, that George Starr or George Clark said he wouldn't do it again, I would. And, and I, you know, I said, I said earlier, half joking, and probably all joking, I could go back, but it's not, there were reasons, there were plenty of reasons, and I quit when I did because of whatever, and I'm, I'm satisfied with the decision. Well, I still, you know, I, for instance, I got a call from a couple that were having trouble um, with their, uh, with a relative going to nursing home. But I see, you know, they listen, and I said, yeah, I can do that. 
Um, once in a while I get a call from somebody that's, most of the time they're struggling with something. And I got a call last week from somebody that wanted me to order an antibiotic for a kid that was visiting and had hepatitis. I said, well, can't really justifiably do that, I'm sorry. But I said, here's what you can do. It's in the title. You can buy this over the counter. Will you spell it out for me? Hey, yes, I'll spell it out for you. Mm -hmm. So occasionally, uh, you know, I hold uh, office hours sometimes in the post office. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> yeah. uh, you can doctor your mom ways now. So. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Yeah, I should, shouldn't I? They've, they've been waiting, patiently. They don't complain either. You know, they should, they should complain. Well, anybody, anything else? Um, it's been, these things are fun for me. I don't mean to bore you with it. Very memories. Yeah, yeah. that's to make you feel good, when you left, you were at the end of an era. You left and I left the medical center right behind you. Mm -hmm. Well, I went back. Oh. And many good, for many good reasons. All right. <laughs> but you know, there's some things that, that they're really sad about what goes on, too. When I drive over the bridge into the village of Champlain, <laughs> and remember, I'm old, okay? Cars park diagonally on either side of the road mm -hmm. with you know, two, three grocery stores, oh three God. furniture stores, two clothing it? stores, mm -hmm. and uh, three drug stores. And many, many drug bars stores. and grills. <laughs> you know, that's interesting about the drug stores. I'll quit that. You know, we had three, four pharmacists, pharmacies in our area. Max Stewart and Moore's, yep. Henry Falcon, Bill mm -hmm. Hogue, and Champlain, Champlain and Charlie Eldridge and Ross's point. None of them were certified and they all dispense medicine. That good heart disease. No certification whatsoever. Uh, I worked for Bill Hope yeah. when before I got out of high school. He and Nellie. Yeah. He was blind. He <laughs> <laughs> could see his way over to the Champlain. You can see his way over to the Champlain Hotel at yeah. three o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the afternoon. No <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, bad. That's they, bad. They, they would come in with a piece of paper, and he, I get the bottle, and he go, "There is the bottle there, and you put it in there, and that yeah." Before he closed the drugstore. <laughs> Yeah, despite what I said about them not being certified, they, they provided a service. They, they did well. Oh, look at Henry Falcon. Yeah. Oh, with all the cats. <laughs> <laughs> There's a story there about him, but I won't bring it up. No, we won't bring that one up. <laughs> <laughs> about Forrest Germont, he was pretty old. Yeah. Thank you. Well, lots of different You know, we, uh, we frequently have lectures about various subjects and they never have this many people. I'm uh -huh. not just saying that, it's true. <laughs> and on a snowstorm night, there might have been five if, if it wasn't you. So, anyway. Hoorah! <laughs> Thank you all for being patient. <laughs> now, if, if you heard about this from the newspaper and you want to hear about future events, you can put your email address down on the, the sign-in book. Uh, in December the 13th, we have Speedy Ar Arnold coming here to do a Christmas show for us, and it's somewhat kid-oriented. He's at um, Santa's workshop every weekend, which is why he's coming to us on a Thursday, so it should be pretty fun. That's at 7, and it's free. And then January 9th, we have a, a lecture from a former volunteer here who's a graduate student headed to, for her PhD in art history, and she's going to to a lecture called Engaging with Relics. And then in February, if any of you know Jackie and Rob Roy, they just came out with a book, The Coincidental Traveler, Adventure Travel for Budget-Minded Grown-Ups. And they're gonna come talk about the book and some interesting theories that they've come up with too, but we don't have a date for that yet. So budget-minded grown-ups. <laughs> 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 <laughs>